Good afternoon, folks. This is um, the afternoon meeting of the House Appropriations Committee on January 26th. We are gathered here to receive our first walkthrough of the governor's uh, FY fiscal year 22 budget. And we're delighted to welcome uh, Commissioner Adam Gresham and uh, Hardy Merrill. Am I forgetting your title again already, Mr. Merrill? Um, but you will correct us when you come on. Thank you for joining us, Commissioner. We're looking forward to receiving this document. And I will turn this over to you. Terrific. Um, so uh, Hardy is our budget director. Uh, budget director. He wears a fairly big pair of shoes. and. Um, you should have, Madam Chair, uh, for your committee, two documents that were sent. Uh, one is a, a PDF, I believe, of the, uh, what we call the little budget book. Uh, and the other is a Word doc of the language uh, that is, uh, that goes along with the budget. Uh, I would just like to confirm that you guys have both of those. Yes. yes we have. Okay. I and they're Perfect. posted on, on both websites. Perfect. Okay. Thank you. So what I thought um, we would do uh, is begin with the, um, just an overview of the budget. Um, you folks uh, who listened to the governor's speech uh, heard, I, I think, a, a very broad and, and good overview of uh, what's in the document, I think it would be Hardy's and my job to kind of tell you how we did that. Um, and we're certainly willing to go as deeply as you want or not. Um, typically, you know, historically you've dug in uh, by calling the various departments of jurisdiction in to speak to you, but we're, we're prepared to answer as many questions as we can. So uh, with that, um, I'm, I'm ready to go if you guys are. Yes, we are. Thank you, Commissioner. Okay, terrific. So I, I think the what, what I've uh, done in the past few years is um, directed you to a, an overview document um, that kind of shows you the construct of the fund. And that, uh, I believe, is on page 19 um, of the little budget book. The top uh, is entitled FY 2022 General Fund budget overview and pretty much yeah exactly um, that, that's it it pretty much gives you uh, for those of you who have it on your screen at home you can uh, expand to 125 or more um, so you can actually read it <laughs> but uh, I did um, in the budget so, you know, I'll start by saying that, uh, you know, a couple of unusual things about this budget, uh, and I think the governor touched on these in his speech. Uh, when we started constructing this budget back in October, um, a few weeks literally after signature went on the FY21 restatement, uh, we were constructing it with a revenue forecast from the August E board that was quite a bit more sober than we have today. So our instructions to departments were to um, please try to help us out um, to submit level funded budgets, um, level funded to the FY21 restatement. And keep in mind, many departments, well, on average statewide, there was about a two to 3% reduction um, in budgets. So level funding to that was a bit of a, challenge. Um, but we thought that would be one way we could save a little bit on our uh, current services um, and uh, kind of suppress the inflationary aspect of uh, budgeting. Well, as the year wore on, as fall turned into winter, um, and as revenue came in month to month above target, uh, what we did was rather than change the construct of the budget and departmental uh, spending, uh, we changed our revenue construct. You know, when we started out, we were thinking we would use what general fund revenue we had, 
and make some changes or make some reductions as we could, but then you draw on reserves to fill in the gap. And you know that was the intention. As revenue came in above target for fiscal 21, we started substituting one-time revenue from fiscal 21 that we'd carry forward into fiscal 22. We started substituting that revenue for reserves. And at some point, uh, probably sometime around November, we reached the point where we didn't need reserves anymore, but we did need it to balance using one time. And that was the case really right up until last week, board met. Um, we thought the e-board uh, forecast uh, upgraded general fund available revenue in fiscal 22 uh, from what was 1508, 1.508 billion to the number that you see at the very top of the chart here, 1663. So, you know, that was about 160, or part, yeah, about 155 million or so uh, base revenue upgrade. So with that, um, we were able to get rid of uh, the use of one time in our budget and do it the old fashioned way, you know, kind of matching base revenue to base spending. Uh, so, but it was, you know, it was a long journey. I mean, we honestly were prepared to sit in front of you today and say that we have reserves for a reason and here's how we intend to use them until revenues recover. Uh, well, revenues recovered more quickly than we thought. Um, and, you know, there are all kinds of reasons for that, but uh, you guys probably know as well as I, I'm no economist, but. You know, the economy has been chugging right along. And by the way, it's tough to spend about $7 billion of federal money in Vermont without having an impact. Um, so that I think in a nutshell is really what happened. Um, anyway, so the, the top line number, the official e-board forecast, which kind of forms the largest single source of revenue uh, is 1.663 now. We add to that as we have done in past years, a uh, diversion of property transfer tax revenue, which we achieved through notwithstanding language that you are all familiar with. Um, but that number too, with the e-board up upgrade, uh, just went from about 19 million to up to 26 million. So that was quite a, quite a feat. Now the direct apps that you see there are nothing really stands out. Uh, there's a little bit more from financial regulation. Um, there's a little bit less from the attorney general. Uh, liquor control is what they gave us last year. They believe they can achieve that this year um, and, and, and so on. So you see total direct apps of a little over 71 million. And then there are a couple of uh, unusual entries here that I'd, I'd like to highlight. The first is um, as this committee knows better than any other, uh, there's a reserve that was created in 2016, I believe, when we had that, uh, the last time we had a 27th pay period and a 53rd Medicaid week. And it caused a great deal of consternation in the building because we needed to come up with that money um, and we hadn't set anything aside for it. So having done that and kind of struggled and bumped and ground and came up with the money, we decided that we'd never do that again. We created a reserve. Um, well, it turns out that FY22 is the first year that we will use that reserve. So the general fund is receiving the um, assets in that reserve. We're going to you know, draw it down to zero and then obviously start replenishing it the following year. But that's the 24 million that you see coming in. That is a wash because you'll um, notice below we spend the same amount of money. So the the, the kind of revenue and use impact on the general fund is a wash, but it is a revenue source and we do need to list it up top. The number that you see below that, the $213 million number, you know, that number essentially was what the governor's speech was about. That is predominantly, or the largest single uh, share of that is the uh, fiscal 21 anticipated um, surplus. Um, there's uh, roughly $160 million that the uh, economists have told us uh, will be on the bottom line um, 
it was unanticipated revenue when we drew up the FY21 restatement. So that money will uh, drop to the bottom line uh, of the general fund. Um, and in addition to that um, surplus money of about 160 million, is another 14 million from uh, additional property transfer tax money. It also is from 21. And um, there is a, an additional 40 some odd million uh, from uh, the uh, FMAP enhancement. And that is something that's, it's a little bit, um, I don't know, I'd say a little bit different in that, and this was really an idea I'm stealing from an analyst uh, of ours, Candace Elmquist, who had, and, and Hardy and I embraced it because we think she was right. And that is that um, the human services is receiving uh, an enhanced federal uh, payment for their Medicaid spending. Uh, when the federal emergency was declared, CMS, which oversees the Medicaid program, among other things, um, decided to enhance federal matching money by 6.2%. That enhancement um, took uh, each quarter, uh, takes somewhere in the low 20 millions off of our state money needs. Uh, so it doesn't change uh, our Medicaid program, but it does change the fund mix we're using to pay for it. So with a higher Medicaid match, we've been able to claw back general fund that we can drop to the bottom line. What we're doing at the end of 21 is we are highlighting that. By that, I mean, we're making it transparent rather than just sitting in, in, in the AHS federal account, we are uh, clawing it back uh, into general uh, that general fund and we're dropping it to the bottom line in FY21 and then carrying it forward into FY22. It makes no difference to what human services is doing nor what they're spending. But what it does do is it kind of brings into the sunlight the fact that our budget is relying upon these funds that may or may not be uh, present. Uh, you know, this enhanced match may or may not continue. It turns out that I found out yesterday morning that the uh, CMS has given guidance to states that they likely will continue this enhanced match through the calendar year 21. So we did not know that when we constructed this budget. Um, I guess I would say that if they do continue it for the third and fourth quarters of 21, um, that will be in your hands to figure out what to do with that extra 40 to $45 million, because that is not included in this budget construct. I'm sorry to say we're, we're leaving you with another $40 million to spend. <laughs> But uh, <laughs> you know, another problem. We can try see. not to, but so be it. Um, anyway, but that 213 million of carry forward includes the uh, two quarters of FMAP enhancement that um, we are dropping to the bottom line and then carrying forward. Um, so when you add that into the um, eboard forecast and the direct applications um, and the 24 million of uh, 2750 fee reserve, the total amount of available general fund is, you know, two, it looks like $2,000 shy of, um, no, uh, $2 million shy of 2 billion. So it's, it's a pretty heady amount of money. Um, and I would, again, point to the fact that uh, over 200 million of that is one-time money, but nonetheless, that adds to what we can spend. So in addition to that, there are some governor's initiatives with revenue implications. Uh, we're anticipating two and a half million from sports betting, which is a proposal we are uh, hoping will uh, be taken, taken up by the House and Senate this year, as well, um, Kino. The combination of sports betting and Kino um, is uh, about five and a half million dollars. Sports betting, because of the way we've constructed it, we'll go directly to the general fund. It won't be handled. I'm actually be overseen by liquor and lottery, but I think what they will do, I believe, is they will contract with um, an entity to uh, deliver the service. And I think part of that contract will be um, a percentage that will go to the state. Uh, with 
May I ask you to stop? I see a sure. hand. Mm -hmm. Bob? Yeah, just an easy question. And I'm sorry for my stupidity, but what what is Kino? Uh, <laughs> I, I'm not a big gambler. <laughs> Nor am I. Uh, is there a gambler in the house? We had this debate last year when we asked the same question. Never mind, I'll check with one of them. No, we'll, we'll find out later. It's a form of gambling. Yeah. Okay, all right. Thank you. Um, the, the one issue that I wanted to highlight with Kino is, Kino will be overseen. It, it's it's, it's a, a component of the lottery system. So as this committee knows, lottery revenue all goes to the education fund. So if you um, dig into the um, language, you will notice that there is a uh, transfer from the general fund um, in the uh, D section. There's a transfer from, uh, pardon me, from the education fund to the general fund. And that money is, um, will be sent to uh, uh, CDD as we had in, done in past years. That'll be sent to DCF CDD uh, to be used for their child care financial assistance program um, to expand capacity there. But that is um, an anticipated revenue source via the education fund. There are uh, a number of smaller revenue um, uh, uh, initiatives here that I'm sure we'll um, go over in great detail with uh, Ways and Means Committee. Um, you, For those of you who've been looking at Governor Scott's budgets over the years, you'll recognize the first one on here, the military pensions. That's something that's been in, I think, every budget he's presented. And he feels very strongly about that. And I think there's really a good case to make it happen. But, um, you know, we, we didn't want to um, put a budget up there without putting that in there. Uh, there's also a small uh, tax exemption for active guard uh, to take care of their uh, daily expenses while they're on duty. Um, we're looking to expand the downtown and village center tax credit. Uh, there's a cap on that credit. It's, I think, currently, I'm going to say, three and a half million dollars. We're looking to expand that to, um, you know, just under five million, I believe. Um, and that, that's a program continually has more demand than there is supply for those credits. So we think it would be good for our downtowns to do that. There's, uh, I think, the, we have another question. I'm yes, ma'am. Uh, Jim. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Commissioner, just a, a question. I know Ways and Means will delve into this, but the um, the tax issues are, is that a full year amount on those or is that a half year just because of the way the fiscal year goes? I'm, I'm looking at the pensions and the, uh, um, you know, the downtown tax credit. I'm just wondering if there's half year, six month or a full year. Uh, on the pensions, that's a half year amount. The full year amount would be roughly double that. Um, okay. I can't answer you on the other ones. I don't know that. Okay, but that's fine. Ways and means will delve into it. I just, yeah. Yeah, thank you. You're welcome. So you see there, there's a small deduction um, because of the uh, tax expenditures. Um, it actually nets out to be a positive because of the additional um, revenue we're anticipating from sports betting and Keno um, if they pass legislation. Um, but the net of it is um, just under uh, $2 billion of, of uh, revenue. So, um, I guess the question is, how do we spend that revenue? And I think uh, as you see below, um, you'll see in broad categories uh, how we do that. And I thought uh, being that I, my method is generally to tag team a bit, I would call on my colleague Hardy and he would uh, take you guys through the uses. Thank you. Hardy. Thanks, Adam. Um, I'll pick it up from here. So getting on to the bottom half of the sheet, we'll start with explaining uh, the assumptions behind the $1.692 million number, which is labeled FY22 base appropriations. Um, so where this number comes from is it's the FY21 as passed. Um, and then we're adding to that a number of increases to the base. We're adding a number of adjustments that are based on 
uh, re replacing uh, CRF funds that were incorporated into 2021 base expenditures um, that in order to have apples to apples going forward in 22, we need to replace those CRF dollars back into the base. And what we do when we do that is we come up with uh, 1.681 million as our FY22 adjusted base. And then to get up to the 1.692, we add to that what we've got built in for Pay Act uh, in the upcoming year. Um, that's a number of 11.4 million for Pay Act. And now this number for Pay Act is actually lower, uh, lower than you would expect. And the reason for this is the way we are incorporating a, a health benefits premium holiday into this budget. And, and the idea there is that we've uh, accrued enough in our reserves that we actually need to, 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 it, to follow federal Jesus. guidelines. We actually wanna, wanna reduce that amount some. And we'll do that by taking the first two weeks of FY22 and uh, there will be a premium holiday in which neither employees pay their contribution or employers pay their contribution. And basically the premiums will, allocations will be funded out of reserve. And the net effect of that on the general fund is to reduce- Just to be clear though, money. those reserves are not our general fund reserves. Those are a medical benefits fund reserve. Yeah. Exactly, which have, which have reached such a high point that, um, uh, that this is actually a, a recommended practice you know, for, for federal compliance reasons. Yeah. Um, we made a decision to take the premium holiday in the first two weeks of 22 and plan on it and actually build it into the budget. And the net effect of that is about a $4.1 million uh, GF impact. And, uh, and the way we're handling it is basically by reducing the Pay Act distribution, which means we're budgeting, um, when we budget the internal service fund charges for employee benefits, um, those budgets will be budgeted for 52 weeks, but um, for the first two weeks, they simply won't be charged to departments. So when departments come back uh, to request their Pay Act monies, um, they will have had this, this, in addition to the increases in personal services due to Pay Act, there will also be this corresponding $4.1 million decrease in benefits costs spread among, spread statewide. So they'll have, so they won't have to ask for as much at Pay Act. So the way that, that's how we figured out uh, how, to how to best handle this premium holiday in the budget. So the Pay Act amount would have originally been about five and a half million dollars and what we've got built into the budget is 11.4 based on the premium holiday. I'm sorry if that was, um, you know, it was hard for me to get my head around initially, so I wouldn't be surprised if that was confusing. I'll pause for a moment if there are any questions on, the, on that pay act and premium holiday. Yes, thank you. So first question is just to be absolutely clear, this proposed budget fully funds the Pay Act for FY22 using the device that we just talked about, but it fully funds the contracted amount for FY22? It does. And so that amount it would be $15.52 uh, million. And we had that built into our budget construct and then in order to incorporate the premium holiday, what we did was reduce the Pay Act amount by $4.1 million, which is what our estimate is for the GF impact of two weeks premium holiday, health and dental. Okay, thank you. And then if we can turn for a moment to the, um, the reserve account uh, with the health insurance. I'm sorry, I'm not naming it correctly, but the thing that from which we are taking a premium holiday. Could you give us a little spreadsheet that shows us the amount that is in it? So the total amount in that account and 
the amount contributed um, by employees and by the employer, by the state of Vermont per pay period. So that I, I, I have, I would like to understand that account sure. better and sure. its effect on the payroll. Um, we'll do that. Yeah, thank you. And um, I am surprised that we're only talking about one premium holiday, and I personally have an opinion about that. But we'll no, it's two. I'm sorry. Uh, I I uh, may have said okay. two weeks, and I should have stated two pay periods. So that would be four okay. weeks of premium holiday. Yes. Okay. And um, so you've talked about the employees' con contribution side. What is the value for the employer? With, and I assuming you're giving yourself a holiday from your contribution. Correct? That's right. Yeah. So what actually, is, I talked about the uh, employer contribution effect, which is the four point or one oh. million dollars that we've built in. As in far as the employee contribution uh, amount. I don't have that on the tip of my tongue. I would have to look up my pay stub uh, for the personal <laughs> implication there. I remember when this first came up about a, a couple, a month or so ago, uh, I was looking forward to the holiday. <laughs> um, we have a ways to go before you can take your holiday. <laughs> so, um, so if you could provide us information about the total value of the employee side of a one pay holiday period and the employer side of one pay holiday period. I would appreciate we it. We can, we'll break that down for the various plan options because it varies of course, varies, whether you're yeah. single two or, or family plans. So yeah. Um, yeah. Okay, I see another, yeah. another hand I up. Your hand. Yeah, sorry and I, and wait until the end if that's better. But on on the Pay Act assumptions, besides fully funding the second year of the classified contract, were there any assumptions made for exempt employees um, who were passed over last year? Do you mean um, exempt employees who did not receive a COLA? They they did not last year. Right. Uh, we did not make assumptions that they would be made whole. It's just the contract that you saw on paper. Okay, so any, if, if, if GovOps says, for example, they want to apply the COLA for the coming year to um, exempt employees or constitutional officers, then that would be an addition to the budget that you have here. That is correct. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Good question, thank you, Jim. Back to you, Hardy. Okay, great. So we'll um, start down to the next line and talk about the changes to the current services uh, portion of the budget. So starting from that, um, that adjusted base number, um, here we've got the, uh, the ups and downs. We've got the increase in employer contribution for state employee pension, OPEB, and system admin as the first line at $14.4 million. And this number, um, I should clarify, is not only broken out every year in these GF overviews, uh, I think this number is broken out so that it can be seen uniquely as what's the effect of retirement increase. Um, and I'd like to add that we're actually breaking this out, not just for informational purposes on the GF overview on this report. This is also broken out as a one-time appropriation in our budget construct, which is, I believe, a, uh, a departure from how it's been handled in the past. And there, there are um, a couple reasons for that. Um, the primary one being that we expect that this, um, that this number may change. As you know, the uh, treasurer is involved in negotiations and efforts around, uh, around the pension system. And, um, and so this number, uh, this number may be subject to change and trying to, with, with the indefinite nature of, um, of the magnitude 
of the increase in employer contribution and the fact that it's usually built into department base budgets as part of internal services funds. And due to the fact that we really uh, went out to, when we started the budget process, we went out to all the statewide departments with uh, laying down a pretty tough challenge of maintaining level funding, which means absorbing salary and benefit cost increases by making other cuts. And with this number being so big and also being uh, somewhat indefinite, depending on, uh, on the outcome of potential changes to the program, um, we really wanted to break it out separately as an appropriation um, one time in the budget. And then the way this is working, that 14.4 million is going to be a one-time appropriation to AOA who will then uh, basically reimburse the departments for their actual um, excesses in retirement spending. Since we budgeted them just flat with FY21, that's how we built the ISFs for the departments. Mm -hmm. so, so presumably they'll end up spending more and then we'll have this pool of money that we'll allocate back out to the departments to make them whole. And, um, and so if that, if that number changes to be a larger amount or a smaller amount, um, we're not affecting all the department budgets statewide. And more importantly, we weren't forcing them to but level fund with this artificial target. And for instance, be cutting, you know, be cutting operating supplies to pay for more retirement expenses that may not have been achieved to that magnitude. So I, this was another one that takes a little bit of um, attention to get one's head around. So I'll pause here for a moment if there are any questions. I'm not seeing any. Okay, uh, great. I suspect we may have some later, uh, except Dave does have a question. Yeah, I, I'm. What's the risk here? Help me understand this. Um, if we don't make any changes, the cost to us is ex estimated to be 14 million. 14 That's million net higher. So. I mean, the cost higher, is quite a bit more than that, but the net high, it would be 14 million, yes. Okay. And that would create upward pressures in FY23, or is it just, it's ongoing base? Because you kept saying one time. At least I thought you did. It's correct so, that we're handling this 14.4. This is not a one-time expenditure, correct? That's um, correct. That is correct. We're, we're handling it. What we did, Dave, is normally with um, the state employee's pension, you don't see any line item in the budget. It's kind of invisible in the sense that we bake it into the internal service fund charges for each department. So this year, um, really with two thoughts in mind, we did it differently. The first thought was, it's a pain in the neck to bake it into department charges and then at the end of the session, take them out again or reduce them by half. Now that's not your problem and ours or ours, you know, we're here to serve, but we thought that would be a bit troubling. But the bigger issue was, we just wanted to put a spotlight on it and tell you this is at stake the increase this year is this amount. If it turns out that um, the treasurer or the governor, whoever's proposal is successful at reducing the amount of contribution to retirement, that then that's the amount that is in play. So if we reduce it by half, we'll have $7 million in play. If we reduce it by three quarters, we'll have you know 10 or $11 million. Uh, but our intention is whatever the A deck turns out to be at the end of this session, we will provide that um, to the departments to put into their budgets so they can meet their additional A deck requirements. Thank you. You're welcome. And I'll just I'm uh, sure add. We'll talk about that some more as we do that budget. Sure. Yeah, I see you, Robin. Um, Hardy, were you just making a point with regard to this conversation? I, I was just going to make a point because I think I, I perhaps caused confusion. <laughs> <laughs> you set every 
everybody off. <laughs> I think that may be Hardy's dog, actually. Uh, it was. This is the time my daughter comes home from school. So I think she's walking up the driveway right now. And uh, the point I did want to make is that, um, well, I probably caused some confusion by use of the term one time. So I was describing really the accounting mechanism by which we're building it into the budget construct. Uh, however, I'm not implying that we consider this to be a one-time expense in nature. And so um, it that's why it does appear here in the section of the GF overview that's labeled current services changes to the base. And we're, we're considering this part of the base construct in our presentation here and in the budget. So. I just wanted to clarify that. And I, I see there's another hand up as well. Thank you, Robin. Um, thank you. So if I'm understanding this correctly, this line item is just about the increase for this year and all that we spend on, on these items that have been there in the past are still embedded in the different department and agency budgets. This is just the increase, is that right? You're exactly right. Yes. Oh, okay. yes. We're budgeting the same started. the same amount as FY21 is being budgeted, embedded in every department. And then okay. this is um, this is the increase that we're showing okay. as one line. Yes. Okay. So if you like how this works, this would happen again in future years. Not necessarily. Not necessarily, but I, I think that's a good question to ask because I think we may find that it's a, um, it's a useful mechanism for dealing with the challenging ups and downs in the budgeting process. Right, okay, thank you. So I'll move to the next line. This is the increase in teacher pension and Artham OPEB appropriations. So the teacher's retirement system costs, this is broken out as a single line of $36 million, just like the $14.4 million line above. However, the difference is this is built in, embedded into all the departments, um, or, or I'm sorry, not into all the departments, but this is built into the base budget construct. So there's the B section, uh, B dot, I forget the number, but this is in the base. It's not being handled as a one-time outside of the base budget construct and the number of the increase is $36 million. It's in the B500 section. Yeah. Um, the next line is the, uh, is the unusual, although it will become normal, um, although every four years, like a leap year um, construct, which is the expense for the 27th pay period uh, and 53rd week of Medicaid, which is broken out as a unique line that ties to the funds being unreserved from the 2753 reserve that Adam noted on the sources section of the overview above. So now the remaining four lines, if we look at those, we've got annualization of pay act and employee reclassifications which is the $7.8 million number. Um, did, this, did the screen share go away for yeah, anyone else? So I froze and got kicked out. So hang okay. on and I'll put it back I've got, up. I've got a sheet um, up for myself so I can, I can keep reading to that uh, while we try to get it back up. So yeah, the line think, I'm on. Go ahead. Oh. Whoop. There we go. Okay, the line I'm on in the current services changes section is the FY22 annualization of 21 pay act and employee reclassifications. So this is really the upward um, uh, salary pressure of 5.8 million and another 2 million of employee reclassifications based on um, uh, estimates from, from DHR for 7.8 million. The next line down is, you know, it's what's unusual is that it's it's coming um, into this equation as a credit because AHS is typically um, showing upward pressures 
and uh, and increases over the base. And you know, this year, due to a variety of factors, um, pandemic related, um, we've got some additional um, besides the enhanced FMAP that Adam spoke to. There are some other um, FMAP increases that are a factor in increased uh, in increased revenue. Uh, and then there are also, I was somewhat surprised to find um, the, the, the amount of caseload and utilization decreases within AHS, um, which are notable. And I won't try to speak to those with much specificity and, and AHS can provide more detail uh, behind this 5.1 down number, which I know ties to their um, numbers as well. So they can explain more what's going on behind this, um, but it is, I, I point out that it is, is somewhat unusual, just from my looking at past budget years. The next line is- What I will say though, sorry. No, please, please go ahead, Adam. What I was going to say is that, um, you know, as Hardy mentioned earlier, there, there's some uh, FMAP uh, movement in here, and, you know, a, a good share of that uh, number that you see has to do not with the federal emergency enhancement to the FMAP, the 6.2% bump, but recall that every year uh, they readjust the um, normal base federal matching percentage for each state based on a variety of factors, but supposed to account for the relative economic uh, growth or strength of each state. And to the extent that a state is uh, weaker relative to other states, it gets a higher FMAP amount. To the extent that it's powering ahead in uh, one of the faster growing states, it gets a lower amount. So Vermont's percentage uh, went up 1.9%. That is not due to the federal emergency, that's due to the, you know, the standard FMAP calculation. But that resulted in um, you know, something in the order of $20 million to Vermont additional federal money. Um, so that uh, reduced our general fund requirement to maintain our Medicaid program. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, you know, that, that's kind of the good news, bad news. Uh, the bad news yeah. is that, you know, we're, <laughs> we're, we're viewed as among the weaker st uh, states, but the good news is it uh, results in more federal money. But that had nothing to do with the federal emergency. That was, you know, strictly their annual FTAP calculation. Thanks for the clarification, Adam. Um, the next line is really the $2.8 million uh, figure is really the net of all the other ups and downs combined within the current services budget, um, netting out to 2.8 million up. There are, are a lot of individual departmental ups and downs within that uh, to arrive at that final number. The last number, the total statewide allocations associated with internal service charges is really um, a remarkably low number this year. Uh, I just looked back at the report, the same report from last year, we had something like a $4.8 million number there. Um, I think there are a couple factors uh, behind this. Um, for one thing, we, we've had some good luck on the insurance side of the ISF calculations, um, a, a, a absolutely minuscule increase in workers' comp and really savings in the other lines of insurance that are spread to uh, spread across all the departments. We are um, showing no increases to health benefits uh, in this line. We're also not showing any increase to retirements. Of course, um, that's in part because the 14.4 number up at the top that we started with will eventually be distributed you know, down to this line across the departments. However, I'll note that when I, when I point out that $4.8 million um, number in this slot on last year's report, that report was also breaking out that pension increase as a separate item at the top line as well. So we really are, um, we really are showing um, an effort to really hold the line on ISFs this year, um, which was certainly 
helpful in assisting the statewide departments in meeting the challenge of level funding their budgets in uh, uh, which was our mandate in the face of what we thought was a much different revenue picture when we began the, uh, the revenue exercise. Hardy, um, I would be interested in understanding this a little more deeply, N not now, but um, seeing the breakdown and perhaps a comparison year over year of the individual charges. I know that my, I don't know. My recollection is that last year we were trying to um, hold down some of those IFS charges. And um, I think it may have been a wee bit artificial in our trying to control those. I, I, I think we were trying to come into a budget number. Um, so I'd, and so that's a concern that I have. I may be remembering that incorrectly. I also um, know that in past years in looking both at, I think the liability insurance as well as the workers comp, that there was, they, they were bouncing around a little bit. And I think we were a little concerned about just making sure that we were properly funding those. So I, I just generally like to understand how that works so that we're not shorting any of those unintentionally. So thank you. Understood. We'll, we'll be happy to follow up with the detail on that. I think I'd like to take a pause here for just a moment and um, describe with, you know, when we look at the current services changes here in this section, if we um, take out the increases to, so we've got that $80 million total there for all those lines. But if we don't count the retirement increases and the cost of the 27th pay period, um, and if we remove Pay Act, the $11.4 million that's included in the 1.692 base. So if we're really going for an apples to apples, you know, what's the cost not including, really not including um, the retirement increases year over year of providing the same level of service? Um, we're only up 1%. So pretty flat. I mean, that kind of really, that number really jumped out at me when I uh, performed that calculation. And if we do bake in the um, retirement increases, but still exclude the 27th pay period, so we're apples to apples, even with the retirement increases, we're up 3.4% um, is what I'm seeing just based on looking at these numbers here and comparing to, comparing to the base, so. And I think it's important to relate that, you know, back to what I had said earlier, that, you know, when we started this budget process, we were under a very different um, revenue construct. And we were very worried that we were going to be able to balance, you know, as revenue came in, we, you know, viewed it as one-time revenue. And so it really didn't inspire us to make any changes. Um, and, and, you know, we don't really know where we're going from a standpoint of revenue. So we've tried as best we can to suppress the inflation in our base and kind of prepare for the rainy day to the extent that it comes. And I think what you see here is, you know, a reflection of that. We've been pretty, um, you know, pretty uh, sober with our um, spending department to department. Mm -hmm. Yes. Thank you for that. You're welcome. I, I would uh, follow up on Adam's comments by saying, you know, it was, um, it was a challenge working through the budget process um, with the statewide departments and really trying to hold that tough line to maintain the level funding challenge. Um, I ultimately think it was still the right thing to do because if you look at where we did turn out, we're still just barely covering our base expenses with base revenue. And I think that's the right place to be from a standpoint of fiscal responsibility. Um, but obviously when we look at that 1% uh, up number, um, 
year over year trying to do an apples to apples current services um, comparison, uh, it, it's, it, it, it was tough. So we'll move on now to the, I'm sorry, Adam, did you have another comment? No, no, I, I was just going to, uh, in fact, just move on to the base uses. Um, you wanna jump in now? Pick it up again. Um, I, I think probably for the sake of expediency, we ought to, I, I ought to pick and choose here. We're certainly happy to go into every one of these, but I know that you'll have committees yeah. of jurisdiction that will wanna do that. A uh, couple of highlights at the top of the, uh, list, you see the Agency of Public Service um, reorg. Um, actually, uh, gosh, that's a type. It should say Agency of Public Safety. We'll make sure uh, oh. <laughs> we uh, correct that, <laughs> lest anyone uh, start don't, to. Don't worry, <laughs> Commissioner Tierney. <laughs> <laughs> right. I hope he didn't see this, but so yeah. there is a, you. If you had seen the uh, governor's. Um, executive order um, that he is calling for a uh, agency of public safety reorg, uh, which will um, include a, a number of, of um, well, a number of different things, but um, they're, they're looking for uh, a couple more uh, staff members um, that, that will uh, oversee uh, some of the departments within the new agency. Uh, so that's what you see on that line. And I'm sure they'll, they'll be very happy to talk to you about their um, initiative. Um, a little further down, uh, I did want to um, note to you that it would just not be a good year if we didn't go through the discussion with the Community High School of Vermont and the Education Fund. Um, so the uh, moving the Community High School of Vermont out of the Corrections Department and into the um, uh, education fund in terms of funding um, it would result in a savings of $3.3 million, which you see. Um, and we are continuing uh, the new worker grant program, which may be familiar to some of you. Um, and there are also a, a couple of uh, kind of what we call justice reinvestment initiatives on there, including uh, transitional housing for corrections, uh, 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 offenders who are you know, released um, trying to uh, smooth their way back into the mainstream, uh, as well as some uh, AHS initiatives in the Department of Health um, and uh, Behavioral Health Services. So uh, again, I, th that was kind of a quick uh, run through, but um, there are any, these are importantly, I guess I should emphasize, these are initiatives that are in the base. Um, there will be quite a few more initiatives that are one time but these are initiatives that are uh, in the base funding uh, that we're providing to you. So we've, we've called them out separately. Thank you. We have a question, Jim. Yeah, thank you. Um, Commissioner, the uh, move of the, uh, I don't know what the right word is, from Department of uh, Children's and Families to the Ed Fund, um, does that, in, therefore increase the ed fund or is just a net savings of 3.3 million overall so um this will be at 3.3 up in the education fund okay it's not Thank a you. change in the amount we spend on the community high school it's simply right. a change of uh, the payment yeah yeah got it i just didn't know if there were some efficiencies there that i was missing that no. Um, okay, just a transfer. Thank you. You're welcome. So, um, if you move further down, um, the uh, one-time initiatives in this budget, um, many of which are just, you know just terrific. I mean, I think the governor did a great job explaining, and uh, but the. Um, Many of the initiatives you'll see uh, if you thumb through or, or electronically page through the little budget book, but the, the way we represented them in the budget are either one-time um, debt IDs, one-time um, initiatives, um, or transfers. Some of them are transfers to funds that are already existent, like uh, there's a transfer to the Environmental Contingency Fund. Um, there's a transfer to a Brownfields Remediation Fund. 
um, transfer to the uh, Clean Energy Development Fund. So those will show up as transfers. There are also uh, about $125 million of appropriation, uh, most of which, not all of which, but most of which are new initiatives. Um, and the, the new initiatives in the budget, I, you know, I, I don't want to spend too, too much time on because you'll have a lot of time to dig in with the departments uh, of jurisdiction. Uh, but they really, they fall along uh, a number of, call it broad themes um, that I think uh, are, um, that you see in the pages before uh, you get to the general fund overview. Um, but one of them is um, the, uh, you know, economic development and recovery. Uh, there's initiatives with the working lands um, enterprise. Um, there's a, a, a total of $10 million initiative building our outdoor recreational assets, half of which will go to uh, VOREC, which is the Vermont Outdoor Recreation Economic Collaborative, which I think many of you are familiar with. And the other half will go into um, kind of building uh, or rebuilding our trail network and ensuring accessibility to our state parks and recreational assets to those with less mobility, either um, uh, people um, uh, who uh, have a, cha a physical challenge or people who are aged or the like. So to try to make sure that all our assets are accessible to everyone. Um, there's also some seed funding uh, for a couple of um, Agency of Commerce Community Development initiatives, including tourism and marketing. Um, at, as we mentioned earlier, we're looking for a higher uh, cap on the downtown and village tax center credits. Um, so there's a number of you know, really exciting programs there that I would encourage you to, to look at um, you know, at your leisure. Uh, housing is another major um, uh, category that the governor is, is very interested in building on. Uh, importantly, I think for this committee, we have discussions and I've already actually been called in by your House General Committee to talk about the um, Vermont Housing and Conservation Board and their funding mechanism. Uh, you'll recall, typically, um, there is statutory language about how VHCB will be funded. Uh, they get uh, slightly less than half of the property transfer tax. Uh, most years, uh, we uh, notwithstand that language and we give them a straight appropriation. Um, as the property transfer tax has grown, has been a larger and larger appropriation uh, directed to the general fund. This year, uh, we have fully funded the uh, VHCB. In fact, we've, we've overfunded them by approximately a million and a half dollars of general fund. So, um, but instead of changing the funding mechanism, we've put aside $20 million of one-time funding, uh, which we uh, hope they will use for uh, developing um, permanently affordable housing across the state. I mean, uh, I don't think there's any question that they know, they know how to do that. We relied very heavily on them during the um, CRF money. Um, they, you know, they put up the numbers, they know what they're doing. So, our hope is that uh, we can work with them to further uh, develop the uh, uh, housing lots around the state. Uh, there's also uh, in housing an investment in, um, you know, what we, very successful uh, VHIP, Vermont Homeowner Investment Program, uh, that deals with predominantly rehabilitating old rental stock. This works with the landlord. Uh, to encourage him or her to invest in their buildings and make them available for uh, low and moderate income people to rent. There's a large initiative on broadband. Uh, I don't think there's any question that, um, well, it, it just seems like that's one area where you can never put enough money, ever. Um, so we're acknowledging that we're, we're putting just under $20 million into broadband. We fully anticipate the federal government will double or triple us up, or we certainly hope that. Mm -hmm. um, you, you never know, but you know, broadband again is the kind of investment that pays huge returns um, going forward. And there are many areas of the country, of the uh, state, many of the counties that could really use some help on that. So um, there's three different programs that's overseen by the Department of Public Service, uh, two of which are ongoing, or pardon me, one of which is ongoing, the Line Extension Consumer Assistance Program, which I think we're familiar with. Uh, that was funded with coronavirus relief fund money. There's also a, a poll data harvest study and um, 
almost $16 million into a broadband facilities deployment program, which basically is making and administering grants and revolving loan fund um, to CUDS to try to help them in their uh, rollout of uh, broadband accessibility. There's a, a lot of money um, directed towards environmental stewardship. Um, uh, that, Adam, pardon. could we pause? We have a sure. hand. Dave? I, I apologize. I didn't mean to break uh, Adam and mid Not midstream. Um, I, I've been scanning through the 40 page document. It may exist here, but would it be reasonable to ask for a one sheet listing of all the one time investments the governor's recommending? It, it probably sure would be reasonable. Us. We can do that. That, that, would, that would be helpful to me. And then if I may, uh, this is unrelated, Madam Chair, to the one time I think, but it's um, regarding the pensions. Um, my notes when the governor was speaking, I, I think he said that uh, we'll be spending, I think it was 381 million on pensions this year, of which 103 million um, is additional. And I'm, those are got to be gross dollars, not just not just GF. Um, That's correct. Did I get it right? That That's correct. We're gonna be okay. So I'm seeing in the budget, I think, 14 million for the pensions that you mentioned. There it is up there. Th that, that can't possibly leverage 103 million. No. Am I misunderstanding something? So I am misunderstanding. The 14.4 that you see up there is the general fund delta for state employees. Okay. And the uh, 36 million that you see up there is the uh, general fund delta for teachers pension as well as their uh, health benefit. Um, so those are that 103 number is the all funds increase from last year, of which um, a, a hair under 50 million is general fund increase. So the general fund increase is roughly half of the 103 million increase. The 381 million uh, number is all funds. That includes general fund, transportation fund, special funds, everything. Um, Thank you. And, you know, that's just a, 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 frankly, a scary number. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you. You're welcome. So th just to uh, quickly finish out there, I mean, th there's a, a large investment in um, brownfield remediation in two components. Uh, $14 million is going to go to ACCD for uh, a program that they have going already and uh, 11 million is going to the Department of Environmental Conservation. They have a uh, brownfield remediation fund. Uh, so in addition, even to that, there's another $10 million that we're putting into the environmental contingency fund. And that is a fund that, you know, as the name implies, um, is used in case of emergencies, if we have major cleanups and the like. Um, and that fund uh, has a number of calls on it. That was one of the funds that was um, brought into service during the whole um, Bennington um, issue. Uh, several several uh, years ago, but it, it's running low on assets. We want to just build up uh, assets in that fund as a reserve so they can use it when they need it. There's also about a $25 million uh, investment in weatherization. Um, they will be split up in three different ways. Uh, one, I think this committee is familiar with the DCF weatherization program. Uh, they will get $4 million. And the Vermont Housing Finance Agency um, we'll get $16 million to, you know, help uh, develop programs for low and moderate income weatherization efforts. Um, and that's predominantly <clears throat> leveraging private capital, excuse me, to help us do that. And then there's another $5 million for the ongoing uh, state energy management program, uh, SEMP, which BGS operates and, and just does a terrific job there. Um, and finally, in, in the um, more environmental sphere, uh, the governor is uh, calling for $10 million to uh, provide affordable community solar energy. Uh, these would be community uh, 
community energy projects uh, that, uh, for example, uh, you know, my town has one uh, where they build solar arrays that you rent a panel or you actually, I think you buy a panel or two or three, depending on how much you want to spend. Um, you know, this community solar has been very successful across the state. However, uh, typically it's um, not available or, or not reasonable for people of lower or moderate income uh, households to participate. Uh, so the, the kind of the uh, initiative here would be to allow um, participation by people of lower or moderate means uh, by subsidizing their, their uh, purchase or rental of these um, panels within a solar array. Um, I think the governor mentioned in his speech, but there's $20 million for the Vermont State Colleges. Uh, we are aware, as I know this committee is aware, uh, of the need at Vermont State Colleges. Uh, we were before you a week or two ago talking to you about um, directing additional coronavirus relief fund money for them. Uh, this would be directing $20 million of additional general fund money. Um, you know, the committee will recall last year, we gave them $10 million in general fund bridge funding. Um, they, their normal appropriation is uh, approximately $30 million. Uh, this would be on top of that. So we're, we're you know, doing what we can to keep them uh, thriving and essentially to uh, provide them some uh, breathing room as they uh, go through their structural reorganization. I Commissioner, am I correct? Maybe you don't know this, but Peter may. Um, in my recollection that the select committee on state colleges was recommending what, 42.5 million or is it 47 million? 42.5 in is 7.5 in capital. 30 million in general and 30 million or 5 million in general going to VSAC for scholarships for kids that were going to the colleges. So it's 35 million in general. In general, yeah. So uh, yes, this is a substantial amount, but at least according to one group, not, not sufficient to meet the need there. Understood. And, and we, we look, look, uh, you know, I think we as, as this committee uh, are very committed to the uh, success of that institution. And we're, we're happy to have a dialogue with you on that. Yeah, we appreciate that. Thank, thank you. And Not Bob, all. you have a question. Um, yes, yeah, so, yeah, and I think what you just said, Adam, is probably the best you can tell me. But so this is a, I'm going to pass it by you and have you tell me that you can't tell me, but this is a long-term situation. It's not a one year, two year, anything like that. So was there any discussion maybe on what the governor might be interested in doing for them next year? I mean, do you think that this is something that will trail for some time, or we're just gonna look at it year to year. I, and I know we have to look at it year to year, but you, you get what I mean, I think. I do. Um, yeah. I, I will say, Bob, that, you, that, and I think actually we do say in, in this book that this is unsustainable. We can't, we, we just are, are unlikely to have the financial horsepower to do what we're doing again. and. Yeah, I do recognize that they've had other funding sources. Um, as you know, they probably, when you add in their appropriations, their coronavirus relief fund, their direct federal funding, I mean, they've received almost $90 million over the past year, uh, either from state or federal sources. Um, and, you know, right. and, you know, that type of funding is simply not sustainable, certainly not at the state level. <laughs> you know, I won't speak for the federal government, but at the state level, it's not sustainable. Well, you know, I think most of it was Corona, but nonetheless, um, if then I guess if the point is probably 20 million won't happen next year, then in the next year, somebody's going to have to restructure the colleges into the dollars in which we have. 
or right. structure the dollars in which we have into the colleges, one or the other. I mean, you, there's only two ways to do it. And there's a third way, and that's to do nothing at all and let it all go down the tube. But there goes 4,000 jobs on a statewide basis too, you know? So I don't know, it's just a tough one, I know, but yeah, we're into it and we've got to deal with it. But so, no, I thank you. You're welcome. The, the one um, final um, initiative that I would be remiss uh, if I didn't mention was um, roughly a quarter of the available uh, money that we have were uh, proposing to invest in technology. Uh, you'll notice in the language, uh, there is a section that establishes a technology modernization special fund um, that we propose to put uh, just uh, $53 million or just shy of $53 million. Um, we have a number of projects that uh, probably are better going over at another time, maybe another person, uh, but there's uh, a, a number of projects that have been on the back burner for financial reasons that really should be, should be done. Um, you know, and many of our agencies uh, were operating on 19, uh, 20th century technology, uh, one of which I just can't help but point out uh, our um, THR system is run with uh, cobalt. And, uh, you know, when I was in college, my last year of college, and I think 1982, I took a computer programming course where they offered either cobalt or Fortran 4. So <laughs> I ain't no young chicken. So, you know, some of this stuff just needs to be replaced. And it's not just a question of clunkiness. It's also a question of security, as we saw with UBM. Um, so anyway, as I think many people know, the Agency of Human Services has a very large integrated eligibility project that has you know, been receiving funding through the capital bill over the years. Um, and, you know, the governor who you know, sat on Senate institutions for years has never liked the idea that we're funding technology projects with capital funds. Um, so this, we're proposing to beam them out of the capital bill and you know, make room for other initiatives um, and fund it with uh, general fund and uh, you know, trying to get a head start on two years of additional funding. So you know, there's, there's a number of projects in there that actually are quite exciting. But uh, anyway, what, we thought we would do, and frankly, knowing that uh, you folks would want to dig in very deeply, we thought we would uh, create a fund and uh, provide suggestions on how we'd like to allocate that fund, but we'd like to start a dialogue with the committees of jurisdiction in the building and um, get it going, so. Thank you. Marty has a question. She's starting the dialogue. <laughs> right. My question is, where is this fund? Is it part of the governor's two hundred and ten million, or is it something different? It would be uh, funded with uh, part of the governor's two hundred and ten million. So it's roughly twenty five percent of that total. We didn't do that purposely and say twenty five percent to technology, but it, it did work out that way. Okay. And it's a fund and that is this um, fund if you. I'm sorry. Is the fund described in the language? Yes, if you go to, um, this would be in the E105 section, I believe. Okay. It's Thank under you. the uh, ADS section um, because it would be overseen by the uh, Secretary of Digital Services. Okay. So, um, I think with that, as much as I hate to say it, I think we've gotten to the end. Um, there's, uh, I don't know if I, oh, I, I guess, um, I'd make one other note, Adam, on, on under transfers to cover deficits. Yes, please do. Yeah. Yes. Um, so in addition to all the one-time uses for kind of new programs and servative services initiatives under one-time uses other, there's a line that says transfer to cover fund deficits, um, NRB, Forest Parks Revolving Fund, and Victims Compensation Fund. And I just thought it was worth calling out because it is it is somewhat unusual to have large general fund transfers into special funds. 
um, which, which, which are for functions typically funded by uh, you know, fees or other rev revenue sources specific to those funds. And what we've got are a few problems that you're probably aware of um, from, uh, from other proceedings. There's an Act 250 permit fee fund um, which has been having funding problems and running into deficits. So there is a um, million dollars going from GF to that fund in order to, to support those functions. Um, the Forest Parks Revolving Fund, there's about a $2 million transfer uh, in here. They're really having trouble based on a, a double whammy of some, um, there's some upward budget pressures, but then there's also an expectation for far, a, far, a, a substantial decrease in ski lease related revenue next year, which will be the payments of revenue will be based on the actual, um, you know, uh, results of the ski season this year, which are certainly expected to be down. There's also um, just under a million dollars going to the victim's compensation fund, which will support the work of the um, the victim's advocates positions that are paid out of that fund. They work out of the uh, state's attorney's office, but they're funded by this fund, which is typically supported by fees having to do with convictions um, and citations. And there's just been so much less of that activity during the pandemic. However, the crimes have still been occurring and there are still victims uh, that, are, that are needing services and needing compensation. So, that, so we're supporting that activity as well. That has up to $4 million in just supporting essentially current services um, activities, but doing it because of special fund shortages that are being replaced by general fund. Um, I see a hand up. Yeah, Marty. Yes, I'm wondering if in that group of special funds, you are considering some support for the Universal Service Fund, which covers the E911 board as well as other things. They've that's been suffering declining revenues for three or four years now. That's a great question, Marty. And um, we did, as we were looking at special fund needs, um, that did come up um, as, as a question. Uh, because we've got some substantial investment taking place with the Agency of Public Safety uh, reorganization, and because the E911 program is going to be you know, combined into that greater agency as part of that effort. Since there were so many other things going on uh, in terms of restructuring, we thought E911 would be best be considered by that agency in the context of, the, of, its, its, new, um, if, of its new structuring. For instance, I can't speak um, in too much deep, with too much precision, but you know, perhaps there might be, if some decreases in the cost of that program if it's now working uh, in another location and sharing resources with other functions. Um, so, so aware of that issue, but it, that's, um, that's why it's not addressed with a transfer right here, right now. Okay. They have just informed me that they expect to perhaps finish this year 21 being half a million dollars in the hole. And that needs to be addressed somehow. I just wondered if it was in this line. It's not in this line, excellent question. Thank you. And thank you, Marty. Along these lines, did you speak with the other, other branch, the judiciary about um, any uh, special funds or holes in some of their funds and their needs to have, have some resources? We, we did not, we did not. Okay, so I, I suspect that there is also a need over there that should be considered in terms of um, some short, shortfall in terms of fees and how do, how do we fill deficits that may be there. Okay. Okay. Uh, thank you. Do we have any other questions for our guests? I'm not seeing any hands. I'm reluctant to say to the committee, oh, let's pick up the um, language at this point, which I think it, I don't, well, it's, it's a, more than a couple of, well, it's, it's two dozen pages long. 
Um, Madam Chair, we're happy to come back and review the language anytime you want. Yeah, so let, let, let's do that. Give us a chance to read it and we can ask some questions, but we've been sitting here for about an hour and a half and that begins to get to our capacity levels, everybody's <laughs> capacity level, yeah. Um, any final questions for the commissioner or for Hardy Merrill? Okay, thank you, Commissioner. We look forward to beginning this journey with, with you. Um, it's going to be an interesting and different one. And pulling together, we will do our best for Vermonters. So thank you for that. Um, committee. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yeah, thank you. So we are, um, the way this is, scheduled is that we have time for committee discussion right now. Um, I do not have anything to discuss with you. Do you have, uh, well, let, let's do a debrief on any kind of response that we're having or um, concerns that have been raised about the budget adjustment in preparation for when, uh, Thursday. Any feedback that we're getting? Strategy is to be quiet so we can get so, done, right? Yeah, Mary, Mary, I haven't heard anything. Um, yeah. you know, I've, I've a little bit of pushback was in the uh, was in the um, the economic uh, support, uh, mm -hmm. ten million dollars. That that was the little bit of pushback, and I explained that the uh, the uh, commerce uh, committee had uh, voted unanimously. To to continue to evolve that request to make it uh, to make it more functional, and so that question went away. Uh, but I've heard nothing else. So okay, Teresa, is it is there anything that you that we should be attending to um, in preparation for just getting this getting rolling here? Um, I just need to find out. Um, I probably don't need to do this online. I just need to find out who wants paper before you all sign off. Yeah. I have a, a list here that I need to figure out. And everybody's got the public hearings listed on no. the in their calendars. The date for the public yeah. hearing. So I sent you a, um, a sheet with all those important dates and there's... Uh, I, so what was that would you mind resending it? I will. Thank you. Uh, Bob, then I think Robin. Bob. I, I have two things, but I, I get so much stuff on this. I, I can't manage, you know, I, I can't even find the Zoom sometimes that I need to get to my own committee meetings. So anything that you could send me in the mail would be much better. Then I have it here in front of me and it won't get lost. But now what I really wanted to say, though, is on a nice note that it appears to me just from a small conversation I had with one member, the people, the, the um, representatives from up in Highgate area, whatever district that is, they're getting a big airport project done. And the governor mentioned it today. That's all I know about it. And I know one, it's just tickled to death. So my point is, if you've got one that's really happy with what's <laughs> going on, you might have more than one, which is a good thing for us. Well, only if we agree with the governor. If we don't agree with the governor, then it's a bad thing for us. Well, that's that's a good point. You can turn a good yeah. thing into a bad thing, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> you don't want to do that. <laughs> we want to be very judicious in how we use our constituents' money. Right. Yeah, I'm, we're teasing each other. Marty, did you, uh, Robin, okay. did you have a... I think I'm okay on the budget hearings. If they're all on February 8th, I have those in my calendar. If there's other ones, I am i don't have them. And Teresa, do you want me to just eat? email you with what I'd like to have printed and sent to me? Is that the easiest way to do that? So if we go offline, let's talk about it. Okay. Who wants okay, one? thank you. To handle thank you. It. Oh boy, another day of slacking. So um, 
so we are scheduled to be in tomorrow at 8.30. I'm not sure what we have scheduled, but hopefully we, do, have you managed to fill that in, Teresa? No, and we lost our central office. They moved to the afternoon. Yeah. So I don't know if there's any updates you need um, in the morning or if you <laughs> just, everybody wants to scramble and get caught up now that they have the budget. I. The, the problem is we won't remember that we had these nice luxurious chunks of time in a month when it, there is no time at all. But I guess that I don't want to waste people's time. So if we have nothing to meet about, we should not meet um, before we let everybody go. Uh, Maida and then Jim. Yeah, if I can arrange it, I'm hoping to catch up, catch up with um, uh, finance and management and uh, agency of administration uh, and ahead of tomorrow afternoon's budget presentation. Yeah. So. So the, if this, we don't, if we don't start at eight thirty, I could use that time. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. I mean, this is is a good opportunity. You you've some insight into what the budgets are going to be. So being in touch about those, it, now's the time to take the deep dives. Um, BGS, Jim, you have BGS. So we were talking about the State Energy Management Program. It's a fascinating program worth really spending some time with the manager of it and understanding. So here we go. And that's true of a bunch of these. Uh, Maida. You're mu muted, Maida, you're muted. Thank you, thank you, sorry. I was just thinking that C Commissioner Gresham said that he could come back and talk with us at whatever time. I was wondering, you know, we might all cast an eye over the language tonight to familiarize ourselves. And it, I, I don't know if anyone else thought it might be useful to have him talk us through that. And that's another thing that might be scheduled tomorrow, but I now have heard that Jim has suggested we could be using this time otherwise. So whatever, I'm just putting it out there. Teresa, why don't you, so we're just looking, are, are we getting AHS in the afternoon? I, yes, I, I can check with him. I don't know if he realized that the press conference got moved to tomorrow morning and that was the problem with, with AHS. AHS. So, but I will certainly check and if he can come in the morning, I'll get him right in at 8.30. Yeah. Okay. So pay attention to your emails it, because you're right, Maida, that would be, that, that is another thing to knock off. Um, particularly as we're taking testimony from the agencies, we need to remember to look at the language. We always forget to do that and then do a head slap. So uh, just being familiar with the language. And I think it's, we, we need to have the administration tell us their intentions, not us interpret. Okay, no. so with that, watch your emails, make your appointments tomorrow. You'll figure out how to juggle that. And depending on wh what Teresa tells us, we will see you at 10 o'clock or possibly sooner, but we'll, we'll learn if that's possible. Okay, thank you guys very much.